Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Sunflower Sutras. I am your host, Tara. For today's episode, we have scheduled local poetry promoter and poet herself, Kayla Duganator. But first, a reading of Israeli poet Yehuda Amishai, The Diameter of the Bomb. The diameter of the bomb was 30 centimeters. The diameter of its effects range about 7 meters. With 4 dead and 11 wounded, and around these, in a larger circle of pain and time, two hospitals are scattered and one graveyard. But the young woman who was buried in the city she came from at a distance of more than a hundred kilometers enlarges the circle considerably. And the solitary man mourning her death at the distant shores of a country far across the sea includes the entire world in the circle. And I won't even mention the crying of orphans that reaches up the throne of God and beyond, making a circle with no end and no God. And with us today, we have the Duganator, Kayla Duganator. Hey, how are you doing today? You are by far probably one of our more junior interviewees that we have had. Not to say that you're the youngest, but you're definitely someone that I have the proud honor to really spotlight and get others to know. And you have a lot to talk about. So let's just get down to the nitty gritty. Tell us about yourself. Well, I am from Topeka, Kansas. My name is Kay Duganator, if you follow me on social media or see me at performances. I grew up here, went to Seaman. I'm embarrassed to say that I am going to other places because most places <laughs> do not know that they just make fun of it. Um, went to Emporia State University for a English degree, got into creative writing down there, did as many classes as I could, got into poetry and fiction down there. And through those connections, I don't know if anybody out there knows the current poet laureate of Kansas, Dr. Kevin Rivas. He was my professor down at Emporia State University and introduced me to some pretty Prominent Topeka poets, Annette Billings being the first one who invited me out to Speak Easy and launched my Topeka career. Speak Easy is where it all starts, I would say, for a lot of people in Topeka. Since then, I've tried to just go as many poetry events as possible and just write as much as possible, all sorts of different things. And now I am hosting uh, Noto Story Slam. We've had two events and Coming up in October, we'll have our third. For anybody who doesn't know what a story slam is, if you want to YouTube any, you can YouTube Moth Story Slam, which is what we have based ours on. Otherwise, you can also know that there are events in Lawrence at the Art Center and Kansas City as well. But ours is we pick a theme and you have to make a five minute story loosely based on truth. According to that theme, get up, tell your story and win some prize money. Hopefully Hmm. Um, first place is a $50 Visa gift card and every participant gets a button made by me that has our Noto Story Slam logo on it. So they're all unique because they're made by hand with love. That's the real prize. (laughs) We always like volunteers at those events. We always want people to come out and get up when maybe they haven't ever performed before. I think that everybody has a story. Everybody is a storyteller. We want to always want people to come out and especially looking forward to October's because that's my birthday month. Mm. So I'm really looking forward to that one. And then we're doing scary stories slash Halloween because mm. you can't just not cut out Halloween. Okay, are you a Scorpio? I'm not. I'm a Libra. <sighs> You act so much like a Scorpio, though. Last day of Libra. Oh, so on the cusp, I think is what you they call are. It. You are a controlled Scorpio, basically. <laughs> if that's how you want to put it. <laughs> you are by far the youngest person I know who actually hosts events like this. Every other person I know who does this is. By and large, in their 50s, and you are most certainly not in your 50s. I'm half that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get started actually jumping from being, not to say that you were shy when you started out, but just being that uh, sweet girl at the mic, 
doing your poems, hoping people would like them, to just being this fierce promoter who would get up and demand people get on stage. Oh my gosh, it's been a journey. I get really bad stage fright. I think that that's crazy because I've done theater, I've done improv, and I still get really nervous whenever I get out on stage, and that's always how I've been. But over the last couple years, just going to as many events as possible and being nervous almost fuels you as well. I think it's a line of like taking that nervousness and making it into anticipation and then getting up there and for me, winging it because I get too stressed when I try to like memorize an intro. So I kind of wing that portion of it and that relaxes me a little bit more. So that brings me to the story slam, which I have a difficult time explaining to other people. I understand it and I think it is fascinating because I can't recall any other story slams in Topeka, but it's been a kind of hard sell. I think that because most people are so used to poetry slams and kind of what we have come to expect from those, because Noto Story Slam is also through the library, just like the Jayhawk Poetry Slam, but they are two completely different events. Poetry slams are a lot more uh, structured than story slam is. You have a lot of rules to follow. I think that because story slam is a lot newer, there is less structure to that. And that's why I would like to take more of a relaxed standing with it. I think that poetry slams are really amazing for what they are intended to be, which is a platform for people. It's performing, it's entertaining, it's giving a message. And Story Slam is, for me, getting up in front of a safe space and your friends and people who are going to become your friends and sharing a part of yourself. And I love the people who get up and just tell a story as a whim. They don't have anything planned when they come out. They just feel so inspired. They have a story they want to get up and share. So is this impromptu? Most of who we have had get up and perform have been impromptu. At our first event, we had two people we knew for sure were going to come and tell stories they had memorized. And the other six people were people who just volunteered at the time, wanted to tell a story. Um, At our second event, which was in June, we had nine people perform and only one of them came with a prepared story. So a lot of them are just volunteers getting up. Plus, at the last event, I also wanted to fill spots. So I made people, I might have called them sacrifices at one point. (laughs) (laughs) See, this is what is interesting about you. You have this overwhelming passion about the story slams, is what I've noticed. And you obviously care very much about your previous poetry that you've worked on, that you've led up to. You've got an ongoing project right now with your micro poems, and yet you have this almost maternal pride in your story slam. What is it about story slams that just drives you to it? That's actually, I've never thought about it too much. I think maybe one reason I'm so invested in Story Slam is that I've always seen myself as more of a fiction writer than I have a poet. And I think the great thing about Story Slam is that, yes, it is a competition, but it's I'm voting for my favorite story and my favorite performer, and it's not I'm getting technical about did you do this stanza correctly? Were you on time? Were you getting the point across? I feel like with some poetry, you have to get a message. And with a story, you can just give a part of yourself. See, that's interesting because I feel like that's also what draws you to the micro poems that you've been working on. That same just getting to the nitty gritty. Micro poems, I think, are fascinating because I never started out wanting to write a whole bunch of them. It was actually because Dennis Etzel always posts in December, write a poem every day. And I wanted to participate in that. But long poems are hard to do every day. I know for anybody who writes, if you don't have the inspiration to do a long poem, you're not going to do it. And it's just not going to happen that day. And that ruins it for you. Or at least it does for me. So I tried to do a poem in as few words as possible, and I think that you can get almost more poignant when you do smaller, because it's more universal. Instead of talking about nature, I'm going to talk about just rain, 
or just snow or just this moment on my porch with the wind chimes going or something like that. Or even if you're talking about love, instead of saying, oh, I'm so full of love, you can say one part of love that is filling you at that moment in time Hmm. and express it. And I just think it's beautiful that you can do so in as few words as possible and people still understand what you're saying. You know what's kind of ironic about that? It kind of sounds to me like you're trying to convey a picture, like an actual picture through words. And it's just kind of funny because everyone knows the old adage about uh, pictures worth a thousand words. But to you, it seems like a picture truly just can boil down to 12. (laughs) It can sometimes. I think that every situation is different and should be approached differently. Maybe you need to write a micro poem about your everyday stuff or something that you can't express through a full length piece yet. But of course there are some complex emotions that can only be expressed through longer pieces as well. I think it's just knowing what your medium needs to be. It's just fascinating to me that you have such passion for these two types of writing that are on completely opposite ends of the spectrum. People are complex, Tara. (laughs) I mean, that sounds so simple when you say it, but everybody is an amalgamation of all sorts of different things and experiences, emotions that we never get to see. And for me, I love exploring all different types of my personality, of my wants and needs. I not only write, I like to do abstract painting. I like to do needlework. I cross stitch a lot. I think it's beautiful to be able to make something physically with your hands and share it with other people. And I don't think there's anything wrong with exploring or experimenting. You don't always have to show people. You don't always have to tell people what you're up to. But don't ever be afraid to express yourself in the way you need to express yourself. I think too many people get bottled up about certain things. And I know that for myself, especially through poetry and the recent words that have been spoken around Topeka through Ichabod Speak Out, and then the Poor People's Campaign, is that there are so many different ways to express yourself. You should just never contain yourself. Speaking of the Poor People's Campaign, you were recently invited to that, and I had the honor of seeing you perform. Why was it that they approached you? I was lucky enough for that one that Annette Billings was also being featured and they asked Annette who if she knew of any local poets that would be interested and she graciously gave up my name and I'm so lucky one to be performing next to Annette who is Annette I mean there is no other way to describe Annette and I'm just lucky she thought of me it makes me squee a little bit that Annette was like (laughs) Hey, would be good. Like, Annette said that about me. That was my feelings exactly when I was, I got this message out of nowhere from Shelby and I was just like, you also, Whoa. I did not get to see your performance. I happened to be out of the country on that one. I believe. Yes, you get a pass on that one. <laughs> I was in Jamaica. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> but yeah, just, it was a shock for me. Was it a shock for you? It was an honor. I was trying to sound as professional as possible in my message back without getting too over enthused that I was getting approached with this. I think that being able to speak anywhere is amazing and being approached to speak somewhere, it just the feeling that it gave me honestly was I'm finally on the right track. I'm doing something good with my artistry. If people are wanting me to share my words, I must be doing something right. Yes. See, that was what was interesting about seeing you perform is that you focus a lot on conveying the story either in as little or as many words as possible. And yet I've never really heard much political talk from you. And so it was fascinating to actually hear some political pieces. I try to live by the age old adage of If you don't speak, they don't know you're an idiot. But if you do speak, everyone will know because I don't keep up on politics as much as everybody else does. And so I want to listen to what everyone else has to say first and then make my own opinions on it second, mostly just because I'm not into following politics, especially since 2016. (laughs) Yes. 
I guess the reason why it kind of tickled me to see it is that I have been to a number of poetry slams. And slams almost seem to be inherently political atmospheres. And here you had pieces that were not slam pieces necessarily. They were more along the lines of your traditional story format. Mm -hmm. But it was by and large the most political I'd ever seen. I think also, because I have done some of those pieces before, I also isolate them where it's like one kind of political piece amidst other things. For the Poor People's Campaign, we were there to say our pieces. And so I did four back to back that were all very, hey, government, listen to people. And this is what you're not doing correct. I space that out. I try to. I think it's important for an entertainer because when you're on that level of performing a lot, you are also an entertainer to be careful and not overstep yourself and shove it down people's throats. Excuse my wording on that if that's awkward, but I don't want to go listen to an hour's worth of politics if I wasn't planning on it. Yes. So if I'm going to just a regular open mic or if I'm going to a performance where it's not the theme, I will sprinkle it in, of course, but it's not my main focus because I want people to know that that's there's many different parts to my writing. There's many different parts to me as a person. You don't want to be typecast. Yes. I guess that's a great way of looking at it as well. I, I understand. I've had the I've had the same fear myself. I remember being an angsty teenager writing a lot of system of a down inspired poetry and just thinking that I was going to be this amazing leftist political poet and growing up and realizing, oh my god, no, because then everyone's going to throw a fit if I write this weird poem about a dream I had. People are going to be like, where's the political message? And people are going to actively seek that out in the poem. I think that getting pigeonholed is a real fear for artists of all type. That's why I find it interesting when you see artists with very different projects back to back. It's shocking almost. It's like, I'm not used to this from you and I almost like it more. Yes, I can totally see that because again, you have a wide spectrum of interests and it's really fun to follow an artist, especially a rising artist, because you get to see just the different assortment of topics that interest them at the time. I remember with your first few open mics, a lot of the stuff was just talking about your work. You had these really entertaining and relatable anecdotes about your work life. (laughs) And I've seen it blossom into heartfelt stories of personal life, of identity, of relationships, and I've seen it blossom into hilarious, sassy, sarcastic anecdotes about your work life where you're far more comfortable with your approach. And it's fascinating. And it's part of why I love returning to the same open mics is following the same people and seeing how they progress. And you've definitely not to like genre typecast, but you've definitely (laughs) gone on and done different things. And like you said, it's fun to see an artist drop one thing immediately followed by another and see the differences. I love shocking people a little bit. It's Mm. always been fun for me to get up there and do. And I think that, uh, hosting honestly has been my new favorite. I love hosting now. I was just thinking earlier, I need to make an ad that says host for hire. Anybody want a host for your event? I'll host it. (laughs) Because I think it's so much fun to get up there and get to lead everybody on the adventure Hmm. of the show. What is it about hosting that draws you in so much? I mean, going from, as you said earlier, you still struggle with pretty severe stage fright. Oh, yeah. Once you get up on stage, I think it's a little bit easier than... For me, the right before is always really scary. Hosting, I don't know. I've just gotten really into it. I've always wanted to be a comedian, too. And I feel like as a host, you get to be a lot funnier than when you're just performing. You get to tell jokes in and out. You know, the transitions can be funny. I always say, I don't think I could do it now. But in another life, I was born to be a comedian. You know... 
comedy is a really great scapegoat for when you're uncomfortable or when you are trying to get people to leave you alone. And I saw this with the last show that you hosted. We had a number of high school performers and this was that was their first time performing very heartfelt personal pieces. And I feel like part of the host's job and what you exemplified perfectly was just making the performers comfortable and like you said earlier providing that safe space because if you weren't there to cut an awkward silence i feel like those kids would have gotten far too scared to continue oh man i i really hoped i did a good job i'm glad you said that i did i was nervous a couple of those pieces were very difficult and i was not sure how the crowd was going to take them but I think you're right. As a host, it is my job to make sure that the performers get what they need out of it because I don't ever want to see someone leave a stage and go, I don't ever want to perform again because this was terrible. I want them to say, I'm going to do better next time. And I want to compete against myself to do better next time and make that your personal goal is I'm going to get through a whole piece and not have to start over because you know you can. No one's going to judge you. No one's going to laugh you off the stage. I want to be able to provide that safe space for people to perform and be themselves. That's a very noble effort. I feel like everyone has had an experience with a bad reading because there's not necessarily such thing as a bad piece so much as the wrong audience. I agree. I think the audience has a lot to do with it. I remember the worst I've ever felt about a performance was also one of the best nights I had a performance because I had two performances. One was at six and one was at nine. And the one at six, I was so nervous and shaking so bad that the sound guy behind me was commenting on it. To his friend, is she okay? Because I was just shaking. I was so nervous. And of course, I stuttered. I sounded terrible. And I thought, this was the worst performance I've ever given. And I don't even know how I'm supposed to get through this one in three hours. And of course, I had Matt Spiegel with me as my sidekick in crime. And he told me I did good and couldn't get any worse. And I thought to myself, yep, that's about right. And had a drink and went on to that second performance with, I guess I'm just going to get out there and kick butt because there's nothing else I can do. And I kicked butt on that one. So that was great. But man, I just remember sitting there. I was visibly shaking. This poor guy behind me. She okay? goodness i've been there that's for sure see that's what i love though about being in the scene for a few years is that you eventually get your little star your golden star promotion and you go from being a uh a fledgling shaker to being a uh you know a little apprentice to the masters and you you are there for the young ones you're there for the newbies you're there for the people that are terrified because let me tell you It's terrifying to get up front in front of so many people that are just staring. It is. That is that is a big one too. I always try to find a friendly face in the crowd if I can and do the piece to them. (laughs) And now I do when I do memorize pieces and I perform them and they're like punctuated spots, I try to like pick different people out and like do that piece to them, like, hey, this is to you. If it's a poem about, like, women's rights, I'll pick out, like, a couple different guys and, like, look at them during certain points. And I don't know how else to describe it, but it's, like, when you do that in my head, when you go from face to face, you're still, you're performing for different people, but you're only performing for that person right at that time. So it's okay. And I like to just find different faces in the crowd. And some people, I think, are better audience members. They're more receptive in their face. They're paying attention to the stage. They're not on their phone. They're not looking down. They're not shifting in their seat. They're looking right at the stage. They're engaged. You can tell they're actively listening. And I think those people are easier to perform to. It seems to be that what makes this so comfortable for you is... You possibly see yourself more as a performer? You could say that, I think. I love performing. I love entertaining. I love hosting. I love doing all those things. I mean, we're all a little bit of us, a little bit narcissistic and love the attention on us. I don't think that there is somebody who gets up in front of a room full of people who can deny that 
we all want the attention on us. I think that it's just a different energy when you're performing in front of somebody versus on the page. I don't know how that person reacts to my pieces. My hope when you're reading it is it changes you somehow. I got something across to you. Maybe it's feeling a little bit less alone because you can empathize with me and my struggle. Or maybe it's I learned a new fact today or I didn't know that about whatever topic it is. I think that with performing, you get more out of it. You can see the reaction right there. So maybe I do see myself as a little bit more of a performer due to that reason, but I still submit to places. I still want my words to be read. That's why I did The Beast Within, my chapbook of flash fiction. It's why I'm doing the micro poem chapbook. I still want people to be able to read it and enjoy my work and pass it on. I just also really love seeing people's faces when you're performing. That's what I love about buying a local book or a local chat book and then tracking down when that person is finally going to do a next open mic and then finally actually hearing the artist's voice. Because then forevermore in my head, I can always read their books in their voice with their cadence, their inflections, and it just feels like it's 100%. It's whole at that point. I like that picture that you have painted <laughs> with those words. I had not thought about it like that before. There's a particular oh, poet, a Lawrence poet, Jim McCreary, and he has quite the interesting voice. He is an older gentleman and not to impose, but I'm pretty sure at one point a very heavy smoker. But he's got that wonderfully gritty voice. And reading his poems versus hearing him say his poems, so much more depth. There's something about the voice that can somehow add more meaning to the words. I don't know if that's just reserved for poetry because I think that that voice, the way you're saying it, your inflection, the way your face looks can change the meaning of certain things as well. I think that's why a lot of people struggle on social media is that if you don't always know the context behind what someone's saying, you misinterpret it. And I hadn't thought about that for poetry. I think that because when I think of poetry, it's however anybody wants to interpret it. Once I have written it down, that poem can mean something to me and something completely different to other people because they take from it something different than what I did, which I always love hearing people workshop pieces and go, is this what you meant by that? And say some like crazy high level literature metaphors and you're just like, Yup, that is exactly what I meant by that. When in reality, it was just like you were talking about a sandwich and they think you're talking about the difference between like poverty and rich society. And you're like, I was just talking about a sandwich. But sure, that sounds way better than what I was thinking when I wrote it. So would you say on that note that you get defensive over your pieces and their meanings like the authorial intent? Sometimes, but it depends on the piece. Most pieces, when you put them out in the world, they're going to get changed. Anything that I write that has any sort of fiction to it, I don't care what people think about it. But anything that I do that is based on my own personal experience, I do get defensive about. Because to me, if I'm writing about my personal experience and you are twisting that, that almost feels like you're attacking me like, whoa, you don't know my story. You don't know where this comes from. Please don't presume to twist what I'm saying when you don't understand. Of course, we're all guilty of that as well. I think that's just one of the curses of putting your work out there is once it's out there, people can take whatever they want from it. I think that you have every right to get upset if people twist your words to the point where it's hurtful to you, but you also have to let some of it go. I definitely have struggled with that. I used to write a lot more open-ended because I loved playing with the idea of letting people impose their own philosophy on the poem. But then I found a lot of more people were just kind of, huh? I didn't want to be so overt to say, well, I want you to kind of think about it and whatever comes to your mind is what it means. A lot of people just kind of want to be spoon-fed, I found. But then sometimes you do more 
completely overt pieces and people are just like, hmm, there's not a lot of mysticism. <laughs> I think that you can't please everybody and so you have to concentrate as a writer on first pleasing yourself. I think the saying goes, you first write for yourself and then for other people. Mm -hmm. I would say that for my projects coming out, I have totally followed that because The Beast Within is a strange chat book. I, I know that you have a copy. I don't mm -hmm. know if you have read all of it. It's strange. It does its own things. And I loved it. I was so excited for that project. And their response was not as excited as what I wanted it to be. But you know what? It also led me to people saying, I love your micro poems a lot better and they mean more to me. So I said, all right, I'll give them a micro poem project. So I did the first project for me and the second project is going to be more for everybody else, I think. I said this earlier in our previous interview with Dennis Etzel. Micro poems are just hot right now. Everyone's going crazy over them. I enjoy them. I, I want everybody to do them. Whenever I see somebody post something with hashtag micro poem, I'm like, oh, be still my heart. Someone's doing micro poetry out there. <laughs> see, that's what's interesting to me because I have known so many people that treat chat books like a toe in the water. And if they don't get that positive response, they're done. And they're just going to be holding out for the, oh, I'm waiting for when I have a consecutive amount of pieces that I feel fit into a book. They never want to try chat books again. I will be honest. If if I had first done a chat book when I first got on the scene and I, it had not gotten a good reaction, which by good reaction, I mean I sold maybe just over half of what I printed, which for a chat book actually is not bad at all for a first project. Not bad at all. But if I had not gotten a good reaction when I first started, I would have been one of the ones who quit and didn't do it again because I just didn't have the courage to keep going. Now, though, also, I have a partner who does lots of different business side of things. And his response was, you know what? If that's not what people want, give them what they want. So, micro poems. I think that it's a part of, as an artist, knowing where everything fits. Has that been a struggle for you to jump from being a more self-serving personal artist to looking now at what the masses are liking and trying to appease them? Yes and no. I think a part of me, I like pleasing people and I like making people happy. So coming out with a project that I know a lot of people are going to like makes me happy. That is not to say that I won't come out with more chat books like The Beast Within, because I probably will, because even on a personal level, I want those stories out there. I think that for anybody who doesn't know my chat book because they weren't exposed to it, I enjoyed talking about the darker point of view that I think everybody has. We all struggle with dark thoughts. We all think that there's something wrong with us on some level. We don't know how to express it. We think that we are alone in this. And I think that there is a lot more people who share those thoughts and it is the beast within us all. And there's nothing wrong with sharing that. There is nothing wrong with admitting to anybody that I'm not a perfect person and I don't do everything the best that I could sometimes. And that's okay. What is your favorite topic to talk about? I don't know. I write whatever inspires me at the time. I'm one of those people that sometimes it's a first sentence that runs through my mind and then I have to immediately start writing it down and I just keep going. Mm. I just love writing and expressing myself. So I think that the micro poems are more structured. I do more of them now because I try to do one every day to at least write something every day that I can look back on and say, I wrote something. Maybe it took me 10 minutes, but I wrote something today. Fiction is more inspired to me. I have to be inspired by something. Mm -hmm. I have to have a topic come to me. I can. I have a really hard time with fiction sitting down and forcing myself to write something. Yes. I remember a very funny thing you had said during Valentine's where you had written a very lovely piece to your partner and it was something that was incredibly hilarious for you because you had before mentioned that you don't write love poems. I don't write love poems because when I first got into poetry, I wrote a lot of angsty, really bad 
love poems. And that's because I haven't had a good love life. I've had a lot of experience with wrong type of person, I would say, for my personality. And I didn't have a lot of positive things to say. And so when I did get in a good headspace, I wanted to write love a love poem. Then I was like, I don't ever write love poems. So everyone's <laughs> going to think this is really out of the blue for me because I write all sorts of weird, strange, off-the-wall things, but I don't write love poems. You know, it's funny that you say that because I know a thing I have to fight a lot with people is I think of artists like Mary J. Blige, mm-hmm. who I love, and people will say things like, oh, I can't wait for her next breakup because then that's going to be a great album. But for people like you, it seems like a nice, stable life helps you become the best artist you possibly can be. Absolutely. Let's crush that stereotype. (laughs) Let's be real. A lot of people that I know who write a lot suffer from some sort of mental illness, be it anxiety, be it depression, be it bipolar, schizophrenic, voices, whatever. I think that when you are alone or in a bad relationship where you feel very alone, you get in a darker spot. And I don't know anybody who writes good things in dark spots. There's no light to shed on it when you're in a dark spot. I think that you can write a lot of emotion. You can write a lot of true grit. But if you're still in a bad space when you're looking back on it later in editing, you'll never put in any of the opposite to balance it out. Being in a good relationship, I can finally take a step back and look at some of my writing and be like, no, I don't want to transition it like that. I want to make it different and it's going to make it better in that way. Plus just being happy rocks. Yes. (laughs) It sucks to me when I think, because I hear it a lot, especially in some of the local areas where there's a lot of persona-based performances where you are your poetry. You, in an essence, are an act. You're a person, Mm -hmm. but you're also a human embodiment of your words. And it has to suck to be put in that place, to have people expect and almost cheer on you having a hard time because then they'll say something along the lines of, oh, you're going to make a great piece. Yeah, I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. I think that having a persona in itself is not necessarily bad, but it's knowing when to put on the persona and when to take it off. I think if you're going to be doing that, it needs to be on stage and left on stage. Yes. I think that you performing your pieces can be a persona and that's fine and it's almost better because you can be a little bit more objective as that persona. But off stage, you need to be the poet. You need to be the person. You need to know who you are and be okay with it and know that whatever you are feeling or going through is perfectly fine because it's your experience. And don't let anybody else change that for you, or it will ruin poetry and performing for you. Mm. Would you say that you, in the past, have faced issues like this with poetry that have kind of made you take a step back and feel unwelcomed or just kind of, like, confused? Based on other people's personas or my own? Well, a little bit of both. Like, building yourself up and finding out who you are as an artist as well. Yes and no. I would say for myself, I personally don't think I have a persona. I think that my performing is an extension of myself, but I like to think I'm genuine and I am who I am on stage or off stage. You're going to get the same person. Maybe one is louder and more excited and jovial or more serious or whatnot, but you're going to get the same person. It's not that way with everybody, and I have had a bad experience before where some people have felt the need to take their persona and make it personal by bagging on other people Mm -hmm. using that persona and making that an excuse of, well, that was just part of a piece, so you can't get offended or you can't get hurt by that. And I think that's where that extension needs to stop. You should always try to know the impact that your words are going to have. And maybe a performance is meant to shock. Maybe it is meant to make people think and say, do I do that? 
do I need to change who I am as a person? You just have to be really careful about not being offensive and personally attacking anybody because once you have taken it to that level, it's no longer a message. It's hurtful. Yeah. And that's probably part of the reason why, at least to me, you come across as such a nice hostess is because you have seen the dirty side. And you especially, for the people that are just getting into this, you don't want them to go through the same thing. Absolutely not. I think that poetry can make such a difference. Performing can make such a difference. The arts have always been important. That's why it's important to keep them in education. It's important to keep them in our cities. It's important to keep those voices. And I'm proud to say that poetry seems to be making a comeback especially in Topeka, we have more venues open to poetry than we have in the past. That's in my personal experience. Anyway, I haven't been doing poetry in Topeka more than a couple years, so I can only imagine. But I think there's more venues open to the idea of poetry than there has been in the past. And it's important to make that stand for something good and not for any negative. And that's why you have all of these different projects, these community outreach projects. All the time. I love giving back. I don't have the funds to do it on a large scale, but that's why I like doing things like art abandonment. You can make something and give it away to somebody to find that could brighten their day, impact them, change them in some way. I recently did uh, micro poems through the mail. I brought back some postcards from Jamaica and I had written some micro poems while I was there and I said to the first five people who commented on my status, give me your address, I'll send you a micro poem with this postcard. And I wanted to do it on postcards so that way anybody who was passing that postcard along could enjoy the poetry as they did it so they could read it because it's on the outside. And you mentioned that art abandonment project. Now that was a very fun project. Would you care to digress a little bit about that? Yes, I, I love that you were a part of that. I need to do that again soon. We should get something organized. But I did an art abandonment project where I took some local poets art. I specifically asked people in Speakeasy and around the area if they wanted to give me a poem about growing up in the Midwest. And I got some great pieces from that. And I printed them all off and I put them on these, actually the tile samples for linoleum from won't name what store, but took some samples and painted it a little bit and then put the poems it was like a puzzle so each one had a number and I had a Facebook page that you could go if they were so inclined when they found it see the whole piece put together and tried to put them in the best order to where they kind of made sense (laughs) as they went so that you could get this whole spectrum of growing up in the Midwest from different points of view it was so much fun I loved leaving those all over the place I sometimes wonder what happened to them Chicago is an incredibly diverse, huge city, and they seem to pride themselves so much on their art. So I can only imagine that it's appreciated by some artist. (laughs) (laughs) I hope so. I just wanted to give something for somebody, lighten up their day. What makes one person happy is not going to make another person happy. There might have been five people who walked by that and thought that was the stupidest thing that they'd ever seen in their life. (laughs) The person who took it home probably thought it was the best find that they had all day. And that's that's something that really inspires you to do that kind of project. I have said from the beginning when I started sharing my work is that my goal as an artist is not to touch thousands of people with every performance. It's to at least touch one. And if I have at least, I mean, of course, if I could touch thousands in one performance, that would be amazing. But if I could at least touch one person and change their day or their outlook, I have done my job. If you have any other future projects that you hope will come to fruition. The only other thing that I would like to plug is not for myself, but for Topeka itself, is that we now have another pretty consistent open mic for poetry that I just want people to be aware is there. Second Tuesday of the month down at the Wheelbarrow, they have been having this open mic and it's pretty open for features. So go out, read your poetry. If you want to be a host or be featured, that's a great location to get a start. 
If you would like to finish up our lovely little meeting with a few of your own pieces, I think everyone is eager to hear. I would absolutely love to. And one of the things that I have been getting into recently that I have not been able to perform as much, so I've been trying to read them as many places as possible, is speculative poetry, which I had recently just heard of this year. It is science fiction or fantasy topics written as poetry, which I think is amazing because now it is taking topics that I think previously have not been introduced into poetry as much and given an outlet. So I will read a couple pieces that I consider speculative poetry. There's probably professionals out there who might disagree, but I like my pieces as speculative, so I will read them as such. This first one is called Raining Heaven. The sky came down today in little droplets. They sang as they fell. I've always loved the sound rain makes, the beat of a drum on raised rooftops, leaves bending, springboards locked and loaded, a deeper shade of green. Puddles pooling beneath hesitant feet haven't splashed through a puddle in years except for one made of tears. Thunder rumbles behind the house making me shake and I can't close the curtains waiting for a glimpse of light flashing across the clouds always looking heavenward. And then this next one is called Reality Bought and Sold. Step right up. Would you like to see a little thing called reality? It's rare to find and harder to know this idea called truth. Take a pill and see splintered visions that dance and move. They might change colors out of the corner of your eye, wiggle and whirl, making you feel out of control. Pills are bitter. They might show you how control is just an illusion. Swallow them with care. Maybe you like to toss back a bottle or two with liquid heat that makes the world sway. Some think it makes problems go away, but it may cause some to find themselves places they have never gone and a part of them comes to call home maybe smoke is the way you want to be lightheaded clear as day this inhalation shows deviation from the norm between dragons and balloons higher and higher climb through the sky if you believe that i have lied no refunds for tickets bought for we deal in reality and illegalities because every truth has a price and if you are ready step right up and pay yours Mm. And this last one's probably one of my favorites that I have done um, out of this batch, and it's called Sky Limit. Today I lifted above the sky, tonight I may sink beneath the ground, I awake with hunger, cravings coursing through my being, my skin can feel too tight, but it stretches over the day, it makes it hard to breathe when my skin is taut, but when it is loose I slide right out of myself, and what is left behind cannot always be found again, but it is not always worth finding. In some dreams I have taken over other bodies with powers undescribed, and in the morning morning I am back above the sky without my skin and it is tight when I go back in and in my travels I have never known such a place like my own skin for when I go I know I will be back again though I may not be the same as some can fly and some can only run yet one thing we may compare and find we feel the same it is that we question who am I I like the speculative stuff now this is a fun new turn with your stuff Thank you. I try to be a little bit outside the box. Well, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for having me. It was truly a pleasure. And now for our listener submission from Art Zillarulo. Art holds a PhD in British literature from Northeastern University, a poetry MFA from Wichita State University, and a BA in English literature from Penn State. His poetry has appeared in Hayden's Fairy Review, the Cincinnati Review, Be Ladies, Western Humanities Review, and other journals. Katie Wampus Press published his chapbook Weird Vocation in 2015, and Unsolicited Press published his debut full-length collection The Last Map last year in 2017. His critical work appears in Joyce Studies Annual and the Canterbury Tales Revisited 21st Century Interpretations. He is an assistant teaching professor of English at Penn State Schuylkill. Queen's English This was not a cabin to be sheltered in for one night before simply returning to our old life. We knew that somehow going in. 
We couldn't go back to the Queen's English when after a time we found ourselves back in town. We saw the new words and the new ways of speaking, the old ones reflected in friends' faces as they came to understand that they were talking to the cabin. What matters is the truth we can speak to one another. The truth of other crowns and other tongues, of what poured in late that morning through the cabin's windows, when the blueberries burst in the oatmeal pot and put forth their color. Debriefing Do you expect me to believe that you emerged unchanged from your time among the pines? Had you walked out from under the canopy bearing ancient beige headphones and crowned me with them and recited your account into the jack plug, then perhaps I could have brought you home. Or had I received an anonymous envelope stuffed with cassette tapes and unspooled their ribbons to discover your argument, such as it is, recorded in correction fluid or white nail polish, I might have bitten at that lure. But with nothing beyond your tongue's naked claims, what choice do I have but to plant you here, the moonlight spilling truth into your hair, until you come clean, or you change me to whatever you've become, or we've succumbed to thirst together, and give the gift of our bones to this clearing? Other Fires Sure, there were other fires visible through the fog, and paths that seemed to lead in their direction, but you walk past these things. You read the bones of trout suspended from the withies on lengths of dental floss. You keep the river far away so nothing but its own mouth might swallow its petitions. You plug your ears with mud to learn the slow poems of elsewhere from the ghosts the trees drink. Forms. We'll call it fall. We'll defer to old, familiar forms of address, but we'll feel the shock of the new in this turning of these leaves, in the cluster of dusk that darkens faster, purpler than their forebears. And doesn't the sun find itself strained more thinly through this year's clouds? Doesn't it look tired on the roof tiles, its gold cut with enough air and time to bleach the yellow of rut corn? We'll pronounce the miser syllable, feeling its failure on lip, tooth, and tongue, and hint of gag in the hollow vowel. But we'll know it as we say it. This cold and color shall suffer no naming. We'll catch ourselves conspiring like gossips against a guest whose absence lends immunity to offense. Until, caught in the long shadows of the sugar maples, we beg pardon. So sorry. We didn't know you were here. Thank you so much for submitting to the show, Art. Those were a delight to read. And remember, listeners, if you have pieces that you would like to submit to the show, feel free to submit them to our Facebook page, Sunflower Sutras, or email them directly to me at tara.bartley at yahoo.com. I want your weirdest pieces. I want the pieces you're afraid to share. I want the pieces you've had difficulty publishing. I want it all. I don't care what size. I don't care what subject. Isn't it time you share your art with the world? I think it is. Thank you all for listening. Salon Gafol and farewell.